actually going into engineering for the first time. Uh, we are building a molecular engineering program, uh, and there's a new science center that's being constructed. Uh, they're rehabbing the Fermi Institutes uh, and putting up another tower behind there that will be part of a billion dollar project to develop this new area of science at the University of Chicago. Uh, competition in science uh, grows uh, at a faster rate than we've been growing in science. And, uh, Many campuses like MIT and NYU or actually Columbia are uh, building immense science campuses. Uh, so sort of keeping up with the Joneses a little bit, but also coming up with a, a University of Chicago style of uh, approaching engineering. So uh, there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm in that program. Um, the college is over 5,000 students now, which is part of the demand for all of these beds since uh, you recall Hugh Assange, my president, in the mid 90s. They began to expand the college, and uh, it's getting pretty close to capacity. John Boyer says we need a few hundred more students, and of course applications uh, are through the roof right now, so it's a good time uh, for us to grow. Um, I want to mention very quickly uh, the Chicago Society, which sponsored today's brunch. For those of you that joined us for brunch, I thank you, and I hope you enjoy yourself. The Chicago Society is a new part of the Alumni Association that was founded about three years ago, and it recognizes donors who give $2,500 a year or more to any part of the university in any combination. And we have regional committees around the world uh, that host events similar to what we had this morning and lots of faculty events. We actually had a terrific one about narrow Saranac campus plan in Chicago last week. Uh, we have committees in London, in Singapore, um, really all over the place. And we actually would like to build one here in Chicago. We had a beautiful event in May at your very wonderful Andy Warhol Museum. Uh, Tom Sokolowski, who is uh, the curator of the Andy Warhol Museum, is a 1967 grad of the college and hosted a great event there. So uh, hopefully we can uh, do more of that here in Pittsburgh. I grew up not very far from here. My parents actually came up for the day uh, to join us. Uh, so it's, uh, I'd like to see something here. I can come home more often and make my mom happy. So uh, join the Chicago Society. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce Presidents of your club, a co president, I believe, is the official title here in Pittsburgh, and that's uh, Evelyn Young, who is a 1974 grad of the Social Science Administration. She has a master's degree from there, and they just restored their very beautiful Mies van der Rohe building, uh, and they're celebrating their 100th anniversary as well, so it's a big time for that school. Evelyn. Thank you very much for the introduction, religion, 
and history and participates in expositions in Gaza, Lexer, and Alexandria. And I had the good fortune also to see her on television on last Sunday on the Naked Archaeologist, as well as this Thursday when she also was part of the... <laughs> I was not the gun. No, but you, you spoke, you, you were the best, you, know, they, you did a Q&A for them. And so that was really nice to see you. <laughs> And then also I had the pleasure of sitting with her and to talk to her today, well, this morning. And she shared with us an exciting um, a mummy that they have had at the University of Chicago for, since 1922. And there'll be a show that's coming out very shortly, I believe in February to November of 09. So that's going to be very exciting. So I give you the professor to you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, first of all, how many of you have been to the Oriental Institute? That's pretty good. And uh, for those of you who have not been, it's just a reminder that the University of Chicago is truly the world leader in ancient Near Eastern studies. And ancient Near Eastern studies is based at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. A very exciting place to work. It's sort of a think tank for people doing Babylonian and Hittite and ancient Egyptian and archaeologists coming and going. It's, it's a tremendous asset of the University of Chicago. And we are truly on the forefront to uh, snatch the, uh, the hospitals moniker, moniker on the forefront of ancient Near Eastern studies. So I want to tell you a little bit about how this happened to be in Chicago. So my title uh, is Pioneer to the Past, James Henry Breston and the Birth of American Egyptology, which happened right in Chicago. This is a picture of James Henry Breston. As one scholar has written, if one were asked to name a scholar who, above all others, stimulated the development of ancient historical studies in the United States, that honor would have to fall to the colossal figure of James Henry Breston. Breston was a great scholar whose works are still used today, and he was a great publicizer. And during his time, a publicizer, most scholars were not really good with the public and publicizers, but he had this wonderful knack of communicating. He was the first to draw public attention to the ancient Middle East. In other words, to say that our roots, the roots of Western civilization, go beyond Greece and Rome. They actually start in the ancient Middle East. And not only did he have this mission, but he had the, uh, the fortitude to undertake hundreds and hundreds of lectures about this, and also to write very important books, including school books, to make this a part of the American educational curriculum. He was uh, very clever with the press, and a very great popularizer of his, of his subject without making it crass. He coined terms that are now familiar. For example, the Fertile Crescent, which is the arc of agricultural land that goes from Persia down into the Nile Valley. This is a term that Breston invented. He was the first American to earn a PhD in Egyptology. He was the first to hold an academic position of Egyptology in the United States at the University of Chicago. And he was the first really to make Egyptology more of a social science and to garner respect for this as an independent and important discipline on its own. And he was the first to begin to sort of separate it away from its original roots, which was firmly within Bible studies. He, it's also due to Breston that we have the Oriental Institute. He was able to establish one of the few comprehensive research institutes for the ancient Middle East. I think there are only two in the world, but Chicago is, of course, the best. <laughs> Where Assyriologists, Egyptologists, Hittiteologists, People who do early in Israel all study together and exchange ideas. We're all under one roof, and this is, creates a tremendous synergy. He was really an idealist with a vision of mankind's rise and the evolution of man's soul. And some of this seems a little bit dated now. There's this whole sort of march toward you know, civilization from early roots, which are definitely a, a product of his time. Well, Preston himself, shown here as a young man, was a product of the Midwest. He was born in Rockford, Illinois in 1865, born to a modest family. His father ran a hardware store. And he studied for the pharmacy, trade of pharmacy, something very practical, get a good, good job. And he received his degree in pharmacy. But he was urged on to study divinity and to become a priest. And this was uh, the workings of a family friend who decided that James's uh, talents would be much better spent in the church. 
At age 22, about the age here, he went to Chicago from Rockford to enroll in the Congregational Institute, which is now CTS, which until recently was across the street from the Oriental Institute, or on Woodland, Woodlawn Avenue also, and his main subject was Hebrew. After graduation in 1890, he went to Yale to continue his studies, and there he met a very important figure, William Rainey Harper, who was a tremendous influence on Breasted. Breasted was studying divinity, particularly early Hebrew, with Harper, but Harper urged him to turn to other Near Eastern languages as well. And it taught him a very good lesson, his study of Hebrew, a good lesson that really directed his future in a very fundamental way. It turned him, Harper turned him from the goal of becoming a priest into being a scholar of the ancient Middle East. According to Breasted's records, Breasted was studying Hebrew with Harper. They read the original texts against the King James Bible, and Breasted was horrified at the differences between the original text and the translation of the Bible. And this instilled in him the desire to make accurate copies of ancient texts so that scholars could write accurate histories from these texts. He wrote, I could never be satisfied to preach on the basis of texts that I know to be full of mistranslation. And we'll see how this that started with Bible texts really was the underpinning of his world, his, his lifetime mission, and really the mission of the Oriental Institute. So we see this echoed over and over again. In 1889, John D. Rockefeller offered um, over a million dollars to establish the new University of Chicago. He lured Harper away from Yale to be the first president of the University of Chicago. And so here we have the first president of the University of Chicago coming to Chicago as a biblical scholar. And so from the very first days of the new University of Chicago, there is a tremendous interest in the Middle East, ancient Middle East, because of Harper. Harper uh, persuaded Preston to come with him.
always had you have some question about Egypt that's been nagging at you for years and years? Any questions at all about, about the program or work of Chicago or? Yes. This is a little bit off the subject, but I've been interested in the uh, liver tablets, the Assyrian liver tablets. How far along are they in translation? Okay, I'll give a little background. The Assyrian liver tablets, the Assyrians um, used a uh, model, first of all, they used sheep's liver as a way of telling the future. So they would sacrifice um, a sheep, look at the liver and spots on it, the color of it, whatever. And so then they started writing tablets and they actually had little clay models of livers covered with any of our descriptions. That's about all I know about this. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. It's, you know, as with a lot of disciplines, Egyptology is very specialized, Assyriology is very specialized. I know something about what they're doing, but I'm sorry. If you want to give me your email, I can have somebody answer your question. Uh, I teach it, history of medicine, and this is sort of where we start, but it would be nice to come with it. I think there is there is a book that was published called Omen Texts from <coughs> Syria. I think it's by one of the University of Chicago people. You might Google that and see. Or give me your card and I'll have somebody contact you. But an easier one. <laughs> How many graduate students do you currently have? How many graduate students? I think we admitted to the Oriental Institute about 16 this year. It's uh, it's a very it's a relatively small program, but it's it's confusing because the Oriental Institute only does ancient Middle East. The Oriental Institute is a subset of the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. For example, the Oriental Institute doesn't give degrees; the department does. The department of the United is the largest. I believe it's the largest division of humanities presently. It's bigger than English, bigger bigger than history. It's huge. There's a lot of interest in, you know, especially Arabic. You know, huge numbers of people studying Arabic now. Um, for example, uh, doctorates in Egyptology, in residence at the University of, at, at the OI, probably there are about five or six. Uh, difficulty with Egyptology is the program is very long. It usually takes about 11, 12 years to get through it. Yeah, and there's there have been efforts to speed it up because it's, but it's a very complicated. Uh, process. But overall, uh, it's been estimated there are about 50 uh, professional Egypt. There are certainly more than that if you talk, think about people with PhDs in Egyptology who are teaching you know, history rather than Egyptology. And that's a lot of Egyptologists do that as well. It's a small field. You mentioned uh, many of the monuments from the slides are no longer in existence. Can you address that a little bit? Yes, the loss of monuments is due to a lot of different uh, reasons. In particular parts of Nubia, it was because of the building of the high dam at Aswan, which was in the 60s, late 60s. And that literally inundated a whole section of the Nile. Now, some of those monuments were relocated, the most famous being Abu Simbel. I'm sure a lot of you remember UNESCO, uh, this incredible stuff of cutting up this, this rock-cut temple and moving it 200 feet up to above the, the new level of, of the lake. Other smaller monuments were dismantled and moved, but there were a lot of monuments that they couldn't save. Uh, a bigger issue is um, some of the archaeological sites that hadn't even been looked at. Another uh, great danger to the monuments is erosion. Eventually, a lot of these monuments, all the inscriptions and reliefs on the walls just get scoured away from women. Tourism, people are unthinking sometimes. Uh, sometimes people write their names on monuments. <laughs> Or, or also the art market. There are monuments that you find being dismantled by people who then want to put these, these, you know, these parts of structures on the art market. So there are a lot of threats. It's the reason why the ethnographic survey is so very, very important because it's really a race really gets time. It's heartbreaking uh, when you see, for example, there's a there's a famous wall in one sort that we use as a, as an explanation as an illustration. I think it was like 1970. You can see all sorts of hieroglyphs on it. Uh, 30 years later, there's nothing on it. It's, the assumption is, oh, these things will be around forever, but it's not true. It's absolutely not true. I've always assumed that the development of the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago was somehow related to Rockefeller's family through Standard Oil, um, oil interests in the Middle East. 
what made me think uh, of that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting. Well, we made me think of that with those four guys with their medicine. Their contemporaries were running around Arabia at the same time doing the same thing. Very good point. Probably looking for oil. And I wanted to if you had any thoughts about that. That's, that's a very, very good point. And I think it's something we're going to be in this exhibit that we'll be doing in 2009 about this expedition, 1919, 1920. It's something we'll probably try to look into. Obviously, the funding for Rockefeller is coming through, you know, through as well as Standard Oil. Um, it would be interesting to go back and look at the field diaries of these people and see if there are any notations about, oh, pools of petroleum. Um, there didn't seem to be um, even an unwritten uh, goal in these in these groups. They were looking at standing monuments or tells. But uh, what you bring up is a very interesting issue because it is exactly contemporary with other people. Well, I mean, I don't know whether it's kind of a lifestyle, you know, the adventure or the cowboy kind of mm -hmm. of that period. Um, it certainly World was all Americans. You think about Crane and all these guys, you know, in Arabia <laughs> and it's. But also at that time, remember, Americans were, were seen as being neutral. That's exactly, yeah. yeah we, didn't have the rep we didn't have the reputation as being colonial. And we were being, well, we didn't have issues. Those countries didn't have issues, big issues with Americans at that point. And even when the, the pictures of rested in the people in Iraq in 1919, 1920, they have these, looks like little tiny, really rickety Conestoga wagons and a little bent branch with a big American flag on it. It's like, don't shoot, <laughs> that, that, that we're not British. So clearly, they're taking advantage of the political atmosphere of the time to be able to go in when other people weren't welcome. Uh, like the British were, were, at that point, were pinned down in certain cities in, 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 uh, in Iraq. You know, they could not move around. They had the RAF flying sorties at that point. But the Americans are like, dee, 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 you know, taking a little wagon around looking for archaeological sites. Yeah, but I mean, they wouldn't, the archaeologists and the geologists wouldn't necessarily have to be making notations of discoveries in the other's field for the two disciplines to be somehow informing each other yeah. or to be yeah. inspired by the family. For example, these days, geologists almost always go out with the expeditions. I mean, now it's a, now it's an interdisciplinary thing, where it's you know geomorphologists always go out with the expeditions. But back then, I think it was, I think they were pretty separate. In every television show and a lot of publications, you always see the name Zawi Harwas. Yeah. <laughs> who who is he? Who and how is that he was? <laughs> who is this man? What kind of person is he? And, and how much power does he have? And why is he selling copies of his hat? <laughs> <laughs> Zahi Awas is the, is the uh, director of the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt. He is the guy who's in charge of the administration that cares for all of the antiquities. Um, Zahi Awas is doing an absolutely superb job. People know his name. You know, how many other Supreme Council people did anybody know of? Like, none. So Zaki, as a, as a result, you know, if you say Egypt and there's a camera, boom, you know, he's, he's there. That's his job. And yes, he can be sort of tiring, but he's, he's, doing, he's doing a good job. He's doing a good job. His job was to get Egypt in the news, protect the monuments, to develop tourism in Egypt, I mean, secondarily. And so he is a, um, you know, he, he, he sort of like, like breasted, I mean, breasted must have been an insufferable self promoter, <laughs> and that's not exactly what I said about Zach and Rand. But, but I mean, there, his job is to get his face in the news, and but it, it does create difficulties. There is, for example, the for the last few years, it is not allowed when University of Chicago archaeologists make a discovery in Egypt, we cannot announce it before Zaki announces it, and this. But there's a certain logic to this. It's their country, it's their stuff. And you know, over the years, the Egyptians sort of felt, like many other countries, it's like we've lost control over what's happening in our country. This was a discovery made, okay, by Americans here, but it should come through the, through the Egyptian press office first. And so we have to be very, very careful, because if, if you run afoul of Zaki, um, it's not, not good. <laughs> not good. I have two questions. 
uh, a friend of mine recently went to Egypt and complained that um, one of the one of the things that seems to be happening, especially in the urban centers, is as a result of this, you know, the growing cities. A lot of these uh, a lot of these monuments are just being kind of surrounded by housing, and cities are just encroaching these monuments. And so, is that a major concern for us as we look at these monuments and their historical value? And two, you said just now that. Uh, we're still having discoveries in, in Egypt, which we don't really think much about, unfortunately, today. We think most of it's already been discovered, and oh. we're just understanding it better and better. Yeah. And so can you speak to where are these discoveries? Are they in the urban centers? Are they in the there, valleys? There are a lot of discoveries, uh, for example, in the Delta. The Delta is an area that had not been examined very well. And part of the SCA, the Supreme Council, a lot of their um, strategy now is to get people to excavate, not right in the Nile Valley, but go look at some of these other areas. For example, in the Western Desert, there have been all sorts of very interesting discoveries of, of towns and necropolis from different times, like Byzantine era. You know, it's a whole, it's a very important period in Egyptian history. People think of the pharaonic period, but there's you know, continuous habitation. So filling in a lot of information about that. But there, there are new tombs at Saqqara, you know, in the, in the heartland of you know, Egyptology. Uh, very often, there'll be little notices in the New York Times, that sort of thing, and then, unless it's something spectacular, it sort of goes off the, uh, you know, goes off the airway. The best thing to do is like Google Egypt or get yourself on one of the, there are lots of listservs for, for Egypt. Now, your first question about encroachment of archaeological sites, I would say actually the opposite. Because in the last few years, there's been a huge effort on the part of the Egyptian, of the SCA, to clear areas around monuments, and in some ways, it's almost gone too far. The better version of this is sites that are remote, like Abydos, very, very important site, uh, north of Luxor, in southern Egypt. There were fields that were encroaching on the archaeological site. And the thing that's very dangerous about this is you irrigate those fields, the water goes into the sandstone of the monuments and dissolves them. Really, salt and water are the biggest uh, enemies of ancient monuments, because when you start irrigating, the water naturally gets wicked up by the warm salt, by the warm stone, it precipitates on the outside and leaves the salt, which is naturally the stone there. It actually detaches all the decoration because you get, you get this layer of salt that's heartbreaking. Between you have nice paintings, behind the paintings will be a layer of salt and then the stone. You touch that painting, it crumbles, falls to the floor. So the problem is you've got to keep irrigation, you've got to keep water away from these monuments. So for example, at Abydos, what's happened is um, through the work of the American Research Center in Egypt, USAID, it's a good use of our, our funds, um, a perimeter fence was set up to keep fields away. And this has happened in a number of different places. A more extreme example of this, and I think it's maybe going too far, is in Luxor, which is in southern Egypt, the greatest concentration of ancient Egyptian monuments for the Valley of the Kings is, the Karnak Temple, and all these fabulous things. The SCA has, SCA has decided that this should be more of an archaeological park, and they have knocked down almost all of the buildings around the uh, Luxor Temple, including very important late 19th century buildings that really gave Luxor some sense of time, it gave it some character, and most of these buildings are being replaced with just uh, pavement to, for people to wander around on. It's really, really hot too, it's like being in a frying pan. Um, and so they're clearing a lot of stuff, in fact, our institute Chicago House is actually losing part of its front yard because they're expanding, they actually were threatening to knock the whole place down, which I don't think they'd ever do. But they're, so the policy now is to clear around, around buildings, and sometimes it's being done perhaps with not a lot of thought for a master plan of why, other than protection of the buildings. Another big project has been the big monuments like Karnak and Luxor, which are sandstone monuments, and sandstone is particularly vulnerable to salting, is digging big trenches around, within about a meter of the outside walls, digging big, deep trenches. And then the water tends to flow into those, and the trenches are full of gravel. And so the water will be directed toward that trench, and then it evaporates out of the trench. And then in other areas, we're actually doing, the American Research Center through USEID is doing ground groundwater lowering projects with trenching and pumps. And that's been very effective because you can't move the Karnak Temple. You can't move the Luxor Temple. And you know, if the foundations go, what are you going to do? 
just one more question. Yes, one more question. Um, I was one of the teachers that came to the program during the King Tut exhibition, uh -huh. and they did a wonderful job for us. Now I have a question that has to be a follow-up, that my students always ask, if, and I can't answer. They're horrified when I tell them about the Egypt, or the archaeologist who went down to Nubia, and I'll put it diplomatically, got overly enthusiastic with dynamite to get into um, some of the pyramids. Oh, yes. Yeah. They, my students always ask, what happened to this man? Fellini. <laughs> Fellini. I don't know. You just sort of hope he was like, he was strung up. Okay. Yeah, that's what they want to do with it, but I can't. Speak. I don't know. He probably retired to some fabulous estate in Lake Como or something. <laughs> was he I, Italian or, or He was what? Italian. He was Italian. That was in about, what, 1830, 40, 50, something like that? Yeah. There is the wonderful account of, of justice. The, the nose of the Sphinx, that was actually destroyed in the, um, like, 15 in the 16th century, and it was um, it was a sort of fanatic, uh, a Muslim who was destroying it with big iron bars, and supposedly, according to the to the to the contemporary uh, accounts, the guy the the locals were so enraged by this that they actually hung him. They wanted to protect their monument. But for Lini, I don't know what happened. To him. Yeah, Edward, maybe one one last question. Can you speak to the current uh, dig that's going on at the site of uh, the Colossus of Memnon? Oh, God. Uh, third, which this is purported maybe to be the larger than Karnak Temple? The, the temple that is being referred to is on the West Bank. And you might be familiar to, with it just because it has two enormous statues. They're about 70 feet tall. They were originally each made out of one block of quartzite, which is pretty incredible. And this quartzite was brought from about 400 miles away. The Egyptians were pretty good engineers. For years and years and years, everybody would drive by these two big statues, isn't that nice? Um, but people knew there was a, a temple there, but a German group has been doing excavations there, and it's absolutely wonderful what they're finding. They're finding whole sections of the temple, other colossal statues, huge numbers of written inscriptions. And it was just a matter of nobody got around to looking at that. I mean, that's a good example where people say, oh, everything's been excavated. The Step Pyramid Enclosure, one of the most famous monuments, about two-thirds of that whole complex has been excavated. You know, there's a whole section that's just sort of gray. People think, oh, nothing happened there. Well, no, it's nobody's looked there yet. So Egyptology, I, I know there are some people in the audience who are interested in Egyptology. It's a wonderful profession because it, it changes. It's very, very dynamic. Stuff that I was taught when I was in graduate school has been completely rewritten. You know, each person in the field has the ability to really make a marvel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Peter, for a wonderful afternoon. You really enjoyed your lecture. I'm very excited about coming in the spring. Alumni will to see the uh, Oriental display for the new uh, mummy that we're going to have uh, from February to November, and I hope all of you can have an opportunity to come visit there and see the, uh, the new uh, display that will be there in Chicago, and um, I hope to look forward to seeing the rest of you at different activities that we have for the alumni club here. So thank you very much for coming. Nice pitch for our weekend. <laughs> 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 No, what I mean is three, three collections. Yeah. 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 